Hello everyone, I am Bradley Sward, Associate Professor of Computer and Information Science at the College of DuPage in Glen Ellen, Illinois. And this video today is basically week four of an introductory C++ course for those of you who are not necessarily my students. So we are going to be looking at the C++ language, if statements, else if statements, and else's. And we're going to combine that in three activity examples. And so we're just going to work through them and uh, see what we see. And right off the bat here, this is an interesting one where you know, basically showing you what happens if you don't uh, do things correctly in C++ when it comes to the relational operators. So this problem here asks us to run this program with different inputs. So I have a number one and a number two, and it's ch just checking to see if they are equal to one another or, and or not equal to one another. So basically one of the two of these should work every time, right? If the numbers are equal, if I, and it, when I input a five, I sh it should print out this, hey, it's a coincidence. And when I print out, or when I input anything that isn't a five, it should print out, hey, these values are not the same. And so let's take a look at this with a few inputs and see what we get. And I just gotta keep remembering to drag this thing over every single time. Okay, so please enter an integer, five. So num1 equals five and num2 equals five. And you go equal. Hey, that's a coincidence. What a coincidence I put in the secret number, right? And so that is, at least right now, that is expected behavior. But now what happens if I come back a second time and I put in the value eight? num1 equals 8 and num2 equals 5. Hey, that's a coincidence. They're equal, but they're not equal, obviously, right? So there's a problem here that we need to address. And so when you look at this, you go, well, obviously it can't be here. The problem can't be in here. It has to be anywhere before the start of line 16. So anywhere in anywhere from here to here is where the bug could be. And so and obviously it can't be anywhere here, num1 and num2, because it's printing out the, the correct values. It printed out an eight, then it printed out a five. So it's not like anything's changing in this blank space in line 14. So the error kind of has to be here in line 15. And yes, maybe you see it, maybe you don't, but there are six relational operators in almost every programming language. There's greater than, greater than, equal. There's less than, less than, or equal to. And then these are the two we'll, we might disagree, especially on the lang which language we're speaking here computer-wise, of equal, equality and not equality. So this not equals is usually, in some languages, is exclamation point equals, or sometimes you'll see it as that, like a little, like a little spaceship or something like that. You'll see the less than and greater than sign, but, Generally speaking, in almost all languages, and again, this is, not, this is not true of all languages, but it is true of C++, there is a difference between equal and double equal. And that's what we're seeing in this example here, is that this sets, this is an equality. This is taking whatever is in num2 and, and putting it into num1, and then it's checking to see if this value is zero or non-zero. That is, that is essentially what's happening here. So, and num2 is always going to be five, so it's always gonna set num1 to five, and then they're, it's gonna set it, it's a, it changes my value. If I go ahead, let me just show you this. Here, let me move, let me get rid of all that nonsense. Let me print this out afterwards. Not just before, but also afterwards now. So if I put in an eight, like before, you'll see now it started out as eight and five, but this line of code right here, took num2, which was five, put it into num1, and then it did all the checks and said, hey, they're equal, because at that point in time, technically they are equal. And so that is, that is a huge difference between single equals here, which basically is like every equals you've ever used in math, which sets one value equal to another, or in this case, one variable equal to another. But this is the test for equality that doesn't modify anything and just see, you know, just tests to see if the left-hand side is equal to the right-hand side. But just to come back one last time before we show that, if I make this a zero, if I say int num1 equals zero and I run this, what do you think might happen now? Nothing prints now. Isn't that awkward? Isn't that weird? <laughs> and that's because, again, what I'm doing is I'm taking num2, 
which is a zero. I'm setting equal to num1. And then the if statement is testing this conditional to say, hey, what is inside of this? This thing resolves down to a zero. And a zero is a false statement. So this is false and it falls through. And now when it gets to here, num1 is zero, num2 is zero, they're, they're equal. They're not, not equal to each other, so it doesn't print that. So all you get after all of that is this. You don't get either of the C outs, the equality or the not equality. So just keep that in mind. These things, in, at least in C++, can cause you great headaches. And obviously, I'd like to think obviously that newer languages have picked up on this and go, this is dumb. <laughs> Let's not let this happen uh, for other languages. And there are compiler checks and warnings and things like that that go into effect to tell you that this might not be what you're expecting to see. Okay, so let's go back here. Let me set this back up to five and try this again now. So now you can say, okay, enter an integer, I enter five, and there you go. Now it says, oh, they're equal. But, <laughs> but we saw that before, right? So let's try this again. The, the more interesting test case was the eight. And now you'll see here that now it sees nothing changes. The eight is the eight and the five is the five, and these are not equal. It doesn't do this C out here, but it does this one because the two values are not equal to one another. Okay, so that covers, that is an important thing. You know, if you need to go back, it's only been a couple minutes, a couple, three minutes to go through that one more time. The difference between single equals and double equals, this is a huge deal. And if you forget, you're going to have a lot of headaches moving on with uh, your if statements, your while loops, and anything in C++ or in some cases some other languages. So that is first thing here. So let's see. Uh, so modify the program so the user inputs both values. All right. So we can we can just change this up here. I just will say enter an integer and I'll say for num1, just so we're clear on what the input is going toward. And then I'll just do it again. Copy paste and just say okay. Enter an integer for num2. And so now, the only time this is one of those things has not been is not is not the only time I, you know that i say you should net you know like i always say initialize your variables but and if you want to you can go ahead and set them up equal zero like this but the only time you really don't have to is when you know you're immediately going to be setting them through input statements here or see, using c in so you know one way or the other it's not bad it's always good practice to make sure you're that when you get to use your variables that you're you're, you're using val variables that have uh, values in them that make sense and they're not just uninitialized. Uh, some compilers will let you fall through that. Some compilers will give will crash and halt and uh, call it an error and make you fix it if you use uninitialized data. But essentially this is all you need to do to set this up to get two pieces of data from the user now instead of one. And now we can kind of test out all the, the four different ways. If they're five and five or I guess Three different ways. Five and five, that's equal. Okay. Run this again with eight and five like we did before. And there we go. So they're not equal. Eight and five. What if I try five and eight? And to say they're not equal because, you know, it doesn't matter. Some operations matter, left-hand side versus right-hand side. But uh, equality and not equality is not, are not two of them. And so that tests that out. So, yep, yeah, so we've tested out the different cases. And so part three of this is just to kind of change this up. I added this just so you could make sure that you could see that things were working or not working by which prompts were being prompted out here. And so now the next part here is just to add another line that says the values are the same. So you get exclamation points here and you don't, you get periods here because it's exciting when you get the coincidence, but it's not very exciting when so that's how you would go ahead and set up multiple lines. And this is why you want to make sure you always have the, the opening and closing uh, curly braces for things like this. Because if you forget, and I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to belabor the point here, but because I am a firm teacher of always using curly braces for every if and every while and every everything, just so that these errors don't come up. Because if you forget, I can do this. You know that? Here, let me do. I can actually do this. And it's it's not going to have a problem. And but what happens if I put in values that are not the same? 
I guess I could do five and five and you go, oh, hey, the values are the same. Hey, that's a coincidence. But that's not interesting. The interesting part here is if I do eight and five again and I come back and it does print, hey, that's a coincidence. It printed this out, and why is that? And that's why I'm, I want to tell you to always make sure you use the curly braces. Because what happens here is, essentially, without having the curly braces, the result of this if statement, the, the code block is the next statement, and that is only this one here. That's only this guy here. So this is tied to the if statement, but everything that comes after it is not. So that's why no matter what happens in this if statement, it will always print out, hey, that's a coincidence. But what we've discovered here by talking is that we don't want that. We only want this to occur lock and step here if they're both the same. So there's a, you know, so as I say, how do you avoid this problem? How about you always put curly braces, at least until you are super advanced and things like that. But if you always put curly braces, when you go back to add things or remove things, you never introduce subtle bugs into your code. And the worst thing to do is to come back into something that you've been working on and, and then you're like, you can't find a subtle bug, something that would have taken seconds when you did it the first time and you're coming back and now it's taking you minutes or even more to, to like, what is going wrong? Just to find out you had a curly brace, you lost half a day of work or something like that over a curly brace, your boss isn't gonna be too happy with that. <clears throat> so again, the finality of this is make sure double equals and make sure you put all the code inside of curly braces and you'll never have an issue. Okay, so let's see. So now the, the final step here is how can I remove this, change this code up so that it's, instead of being two separate if statements, I can turn it into one, one statement. And now you gotta be careful how I say this. I'm only gonna be modifying one thing I'm not going to be changing the entirety of everything to make this thing work. But, you know, what am I blabbing about here? But if this is false, if this is a, well, say, if this is a true statement, if num1 equals num2, we, we do this, right? But what happens if this is not true? What would be the else? The, what would make this false? Making this false is if num1 does not equal num2. I see this here, right? That's what I'm, I'm looking at that, and I see this. So... So I'm actually, in this case here, I'm doing two if statements when I only need to actually have one because this is what happens, this here, or get rid of the if. If I get down, if this is not true, then they're not equal. And if, and if that's the case, if they're not equal, then I want to print out that the values are not the same. I don't, I don't need a second check because, again, if this is equal, it'll do this. But if this is false, it'll do that. And when this is false, that means that these two numbers are, are not equal. And so you have to watch out for this. And we'll see this in, you know, in various forms throughout the semester uh, when it comes to loops and more advanced if statements, kind of like the 90, 80, 70, 60 grading scale. Like you can logically deduce things from your if statements, but what, you know, when they're true and when they're false, and you don't always have to go ahead and you know, create more logic just to fulfill something that is already deduced by the way you set up your if statements. So this covers number one. Let me just write this out. Let me just print this or uh, run this one time. Oops, I'm, I'm already running something. Let me just show you this before we move on. And there we go. Number one is five. Number two is five. And so now they're the same and that's a coincidence. That's what we want to print. So now the final test before we move on here two unequal values, and there you go. The values are not the same because it fell through the true part of the if statement and it went down to the else and continued on and printed this guy out. Okay, number one is complete. Okay, so let's take a look at this second example here. So in this case, they're asking you for your grade average. We're not, we're not gonna ask for multiple inputs and calculate an average. You did all that by calculator or whatever. So we're saying input your average. And we'll say if the average is greater than 60, you pass, and if, or, I mean, however you want, and, or, whatever. If the average is less than 60, we're gonna print out you fail. So let's try different values here. So I always have to drag this over. So 90, you pass, of course, because it's greater than 60. 
and input your average, about 15. That's not very good at all, and you fail. But what happens, looking at this, what happens if I do 60? You go, nothing prints. And then <laughs> you stare off into space and you put this thing on Reddit and go, did I pass? Did I fail? You ask the teacher, the teacher doesn't know. You know <laughs> the instructor doesn't, like, did I pass or did I fail? So normally 60 right on the dot is pass. So in this case, let's modify this, this first if statement. You might, you might be like, well, what happens if? How about this? Okay, you're like, oh my goodness. How about I add, a, how about I add another if statement? I say, okay. If the average is double equals to 60, remember again, you have to double, if, if I put a single equals, it will always print you pass. And then it might print you fail afterwards, depending on the score. But you're like, oh my God, look at that. Okay, we, we've handled every case we can now. Because we've handled greater than 60, less than 60, equal to 60, right? I mean, they, and then you go, why did, you, why did I get points off for putting all of this code in here? And you go, well, because there are more efficient ways to get this thing done. So how can we how can we take all of this crazy code and change it so that it it works? The so first thing I could do is eliminate that I just did and change this so it's greater than or equal to 60. And so now we run let's just run the same three things here, 90, you pass, okay? 15 or whatever, 20, they got better. You fail and then We'll try exactly 60 this time, and then you go, oh, there we go, you pass. So you're like, That's, this is definitely an improvement. This is a step up. So we've hand, we handle both of those th two cases of the three in this statement. But now what happens, you know, it's basically coming back. What, okay, if average is greater than or equal to 60, yes, I do this. But what happens if this is false? What is the opposite? What, what would have happened? The only way we fall out of this without printing and make this false is if the average is less than 60, which is exactly what we're staring at here. So in, this is almost the same thing as the previous problem. So logically speaking, if this is false, then this has to be true, and I don't have to do anything more than just make this an else. So this is the way to go. One if statement handles all the cases. You don't have to think logically, you know, you don't have to think logically more than just what you're staring at one time over instead of two or three times. So then just to go fast, 90 is pass, 25 getting better is fail, and then 60 on the dot is also pass. Okay, so that handles, that, that basically for this exact problem is the best you can do uh, with this kind of thing. If average is greater than 60, do this, otherwise do that. Okay, so then last thing I want to do is set up, uh, so I have an A category, a B category, Basically, C and D get grouped together, and then anything fail is, uh, is lower than that. So I'm going to change this up here. So now, so here, I'm, I'm going to add this, and I'm going to use a ton of ifs and else ifs and else ifs and things like that. So if my average is greater than or equal to uh, 90, up, up, well, up, well, up, well you know, first off, yeah, if it's greater than or equal to 90, I get an A. However, in this example that, I'm that I want to do here, anything above 100, not, not greater than or equal to 100, greater than 100 is invalid data. Okay, oops, and I could spell. I really can. I really can. Okay, invalid data. Okay, so then now, if that's not true, that means if this is you know if, if this is true, obviously the average is greater than 100. But if it's not, the average has to be less than or equal to 100. So okay, but now, what if the average is greater than or equal to 90? So values from 90, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, 98, 99, and 100. That is my A range. I'll give you lots of exclamation points for that. Okay, so that's great. So now we've handled anything 90 and above, you know, and 100 and above if you want to think about it that way. And so, and notice I didn't have to put in a secondary part of this if statement that says if the average is less than or equal to 100, because again, it's known if this is false, then we get that. 
And you are absolutely going to see this in other examples that you do when it comes to the grading scales and things like that. Like you don't have to add anything more than what you see here. Anything you do add just is thing, just are things that could go wrong and like, you know, bugs in the program if you screw something up, you don't have to go any further. So just change, just taking this now, if it's not greater than 100 and it's not greater than or equal to 90, well then it's gotta be anywhere from negative infinity to 89. So what if it's greater than or equal to 80? Now it's a B and you only get one exclamation point because you know, I'm taken away. I'm withholding those exclamation points from you. So that handles the B range. But now if anything else, let me, get, let me put this in else here. Else if the average is greater than or equal to 60, well then you passed. But now in this case here, instead of just an if, what this thing is asking me to do for you guys is to say if the average is greater than or equal to 60, or I'm sorry, equal to zero, then you fail. And that should cover all the cases, right? Let's try all, let's try all, there's five different ways to try this, right? So I'll put uh, 119. And so when you test this, it's always good to test right around the boundary conditions. So 119 is not really the boundary condition. But 101 is, that is invalid data. What about 100? That is A. And like, what about 99? 99 is A. Okay, so we've handled right around this guy here, the 100 condition. We go, okay, that is working for us. If you, if you forget these things and you do them incorrectly, you might get what we call off by one errors, where things are slightly wrong right on the boundary conditions. So like 91 is an A. 90 is an A, 89, B. Okay, so now working my way down. And if 89 is a B, then, and 81 is a B, you can kind of guess that everything in between is gonna be a B too, so you don't really have to test anything like that out. What about 80, B? All right, so now the question is, what about 79, right? So 79 is a pass, which is this guy here, right? Because we've worked our way down into the pass range. So let's see, 61, pass, 60, pass, and then 59 is where we start the failure range, and you fail. And then now here is the question, I get zero. Okay, zero is a failure. Just try one, just to be, just to, okay, we got one, that was it, okay. And now what, now what happens if I put anything negative? 80, negative 80, nothing prints. And that's because Everything we have here, all of this code is for everything zero and up, from zero to positive infinity, or in this case, from zero to positive 2.14 billion, or whatever that number is for the largest. Oh wait, it's, it's, it, there's a double, a double here. So things can be, <laughs> you can put in a very large value in here and you will still get the correct results. So the final step would be here, how do I handle anything negative? That is my default here, this is my, the final case here, this is where I would put invalid data here as well. So that is one way to handle this when you, ha when you deal with a negative result, is to have, there's a lot, you know, so there, invalid data finally for all negative values. So now this bunch of if, else, ifs, and else will handle anything from negative infinity to positive infinity when it comes to, so basically handles all, every possible input that you could do as long as it's a numerical value and not just some crazy string of some kind, which uh, we cover that in advanced C++. What if the user inputs a string instead of a number? But that's not your concern at this point. Okay, so that covers pretty much everything I wanted to talk about in this one. So now we have one last problem. So let's take a look at that. All right, the final problem of the day here. So we have this program, or you know, basically you're going off to college, you're going off to university of somewhere not around here, and let's just say that the uh, <laughs> you've traveled back in time too. It, it's the three thousand dollars per semester for in-state tuition and forty-five hundred dollars per semester for out-of-state tuition, and that's the tuition side of things. And so, or, and basically, that's if you're a resident or not. And so, you know, so it's 
kind of crazy here where you can say do you need room and board yes or no and if you if you are if you do need it i mean i guess if you don't need it it's always a zero right so even if you <laughs> i don't know how you would have how would you, how would you be out of state oh i guess maybe you're living off campus it all depends sometimes you're not allowed to as a as a freshman or something like that but anyway so it's always a zero for the room and board you know because you're always going you know you're presuming you're going to school so if you don't need tuition it's zero or, i'm sorry room and board it's zero but if you are in state then it's 2500 extra dollars and if you're not it's 3500 extra dollars if you're coming from out of state so write a program that asks the user for input for an iron in, in, for in-state or out-of-state, and then for room and board, yes or no, and then compute the values that needed to be, you know, that need to be. So there should be, I guess, three different ways of doing things, because you're always going to get one of these two, and maybe four different ways, right? So, yeah, 3,000 plus zero, or 4,500 plus zero. So there's a lot of different ways this could go, right? So well, we're going to have to think out and make sure that we cover all those examples as we go. So the first thing I want to do is get the user to input... Uh, yeah, like it is student out of state or in state or out of state. And then I can tell them specifically, I want you to put an I or an O. That's usually, I mean, you know, so something like that. And then I can just use a character for this. I don't need a string or anything like that. And I'll say in state. And then I'll input that value from the user and put it in there, and we'll keep that. And just, and I'll teach you a little something here. There's a little function called to upper that you can use, and that will take the one character, and it'll, if it's a lowercase character, it'll make it uppercase. It doesn't do special characters, obviously. There's no such thing as an uppercase dollar sign or something like that. But if it's a, like a lowercase i, it'll turn it into an uppercase i. That just makes it easier on us to do. So that covers the first input. So now I have the second input. Does the student require room and board or something like that? Does the student need room and board? Question mark. And you can say yes or no, y or no. And then now we'll keep character for in state, and I'll do the same thing for room room board. Okay. So then uh, let's input to that. Let me just steal this guy. I don't have to type it all the time. And there we go. So cool. So we get, those are the that's the input stage, right? Let's try that out. Let's just see that it's working here. Is the student in state or out of state? Like I, again, I could put anything, and it, we'll have to deal with that. It's like, oops, I don't know what the you know semester bill is going to be or something like that. So yep, yeah, okay, everything looks pretty happy here. Uh, maybe I just add uh, one more space or something so everything kind of looks a little better. Okay, so there's my input stage. So my calculation stage is you know basically what is my tuition or is it tuition at that point? Or is it uh, the bill? Uh, and I guess we'll use int because I don't see anything. Oh, you know, just maybe future proofing it. Maybe I can use a double since you know, since maybe sometime later on it'll be twenty four ninety five or something. You know, twenty nine ninety five something point six two. Don't we always get to, you know things like that? And it gets crazy with those kind of bills. So the bill starts out at zero. And let me just, let's just say, you know, the calculation stage goes here. Lots of exclamation points. And then the output stage is very simple. The total bill will be, and then uh, will be this dollar sign, and then whatever. And then I will input or output the bill in an end line. And just to be clear about this too, I'm going to put in, I'll use IOMANIP. I have IOStream here. Let's use IOMANIP so we can make this thing look nicer. And just use the, uh, the fixed tag and then the set precision tag. And then two. So there's two decimal places, two after the decimal dot. Okay. So just to, just to show that that's all working. 
let's see, the in-student tuition, blah, 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 is, I mean, it doesn't matter what I type. I just want to see that the total bill will be 0, 0, 0. Yep, that's exactly what I want to see. Okay, so now we can go back in and fill in here. And they say, if my in-state equals the capital I, and again, because of the two upper, I don't have to worry about if it's uppercase I or lowercase I. I just have to do the one if check. So if it is, we've said that that's 3,000. So in our uh, bill plus equals $3,000. And another thing you might want to do, since this is just to kind of, if you don't want to do this, that's fine, is that to make this program easier to use later on is to just go up here and set up constants. And so in, uh, in state tuition, I, that's not how I spell it, but I just went tuition equals $3,000. Just so you can, so you don't, you know, if I ever want to go back and obviously tuition changes minute to minute, it seems like that's every other minute, that you don't, all you have to do is go back into here to change the value. You don't have to think of any of the logic that go, went into this. You just have to change a few values here and then the whole program will still run like it's supposed to. So I can go ahead and just replace in-state tuition with out, I'll just say out-state, or you can just say out-of-state. And then that was 4,500. Okay, so if the in-state, if, if this variable is an I, then we go in-state else, else what, right? Else if it's an O, then we go and say, oh, out of state. And then what do you want to, that's the question here. What do you want to do if things go wrong and I don't put in an I or an O? Really, that's a, that's a tough one, right? So like a few things you could do is just, you could halt the program or things like that or, you know, it just it gets complicated. I don't want to get too too much into this. Like what would you know? Basically, this is the oops case. But you, you you know that's for another time. But I just want you to see that even for simple programs like this, that you know what? How do you handle those error cases? Because I don't want to just crash the program. In a like in a real world example, maybe I would just say, hey, that's not what I was expecting. Try again. I don't want to be like. Halt the whole program. That would be that wouldn't that wouldn't work out for us. But we're not. So I'm not going to worry about it in this case, because this is week four of the first semester of your C++ uh, education here. Okay. So, so then what do we do if the answer is uh, yes? Okay. So this is where things get a little interesting, and this is where you know you and you and I might differ on our understanding of where to put these things, because like, it, does the student need room and board? Yes or no? If I put it in here, and I put it in here, because these are the two ways that it can go, I'm duplicating my code. And but any but otherwise, you know, how do you know there's other ways to do this, right? Do I combine my code into, you know, or do I separate my code, my if statements inside of here? So one way I could do this here then is to say if my uh, room board equal to yes, then I want to make sure that I take my bill and I do in state room board here. Let me just, let's fill in these values here. Oops. In state room board. Oops. And then I can steal this guy, put it out of state room board, and then I can change the values. They're 2,500 and 3,500. Okay, so then in state room and board. And I could steal this guy and I could put it in here. Out of state room board. And now you can kind of see where we're going with this kind of stuff. So there's, in the, if I do everything correctly, there's four different, at least four different ways I could test this, right? But there's actually, because of this, there, well, there's, you know, there's many different ways we can go with this. So let's try out all the happy cases. Okay, am I in state? I'm in state. And do I need Roman board? Yes. So that should be $5,500. There we 
we go. And so what happens if I do in state and no, then I should be $3,000. And I am. Okay, so there's, so I've handled in state yes and in state no, and I get all the, I get all of those cases. So now what happens if I do out of state yes and out of state no? Out of state yes should be $5,500. Oops, I'm sorry, $8,000. That's absolutely right here. Because it's 4,500 plus 25, nope, nope. Out of state tuition plus, because it's out of state tuition and I need room and board, it's $8,000. Sorry, it, gets, it does get confusing. And so now, how about the same? I'm, I'm out of state and I don't need anything. So it's gonna be 4,500 because that's my out of state tuition. So yes, so now I've, I've handled this, this with the yes case, this with the no case, and then I've handled this with the yes case and this with the no case. So then everything else is basically just oopsie cases for the most part, right? If I, if I, don't, if I put in valid val values for in-state and room and board, I've tested everything out and I know I get what I'm supposed to. So this is where things can get interesting again. Like there are other, there's another way to do this. I don't, but it, but it doubles up the amount of code. I don't, I'm kind of at a crossroads. Should I show you or should I not? And I'm thinking I shouldn't show you the alternate way to do things because then I'll show you bad habits. Some of you will fast forward to that and think that's a good habit, not seeing that and be like, don't do this. So anyway, so I'm going to leave this as is and say this handles all four cases perfectly well. And so, and, and I don't want to get any more complicated. But like here, you, at least you know if you get to here, you know that they didn't put an I or an O. And you, here, it doesn't hurt anybody right now to, you, to say something like invalid input for tuition. Because we know that, right? At least we can handle that case. I always say I'm never going to do it, and then I do it anyway, right? So let's see, if I put it in something that's not an I, not an O, like a P. They go, uh-oh, we got to do this other input first. And they go, yes or no? No. And it says invalid input for tuition. The total bill will be zero, right? We're, that's something we, again, this is why things get a little complicated because of all these different cases. So why don't we just not worry about it, like I was saying before? Because the, the other way to do things here is that what happens if I put uh, anything that's not a Y or an N? Because in this case, we're, not even, we're never even checking for N, right? When it comes to the way the room and board is set up. We're just checking for that y value. And so what you could do here is to say else, and then to say if room board does not equal n, then say invalid input for room and board. And you'd have to do this twice. And I, that's why I, kind of, I shy away from this. Oh, well, let me put... Let me put this back so we had all the cases here. If uh, in state, oh wait, just an else. It's just an else. Input uh, input invalid for tuition. So there you go. That handles all the cases now, because n is a perfectly legitimate response, right, to these questions that that are being asked of us. Am I in in state or out of state? I'm in state. Do I need a room? I'm just going to put in an n. And so everything prints out. But what if I do an I with a P? And it goes, input, invalid input for room and board. The total bill would be 3,000. And what if I do the wrong input for both? It won't, will it do both? I don't think it'll do both. J and H. And it just gives us the, the, the input was invalid for tuition. So like, there's a lot of things that can go for a simple program like this. There's a lot of little things that can go around. There's like 8 to 12 or whatever different cases that need to be handled, especially on the bad side. And that's why we don't teach this stuff up front. So if you, avoid, if you avoided this conversation, you probably did well for yourself. But you can see how maybe you'll appreciate programmers and things a little more, when, especially bugs in video games and stuff like that. You'd be like, how in the world did they forget or not notice that? And they go, maybe they, did, maybe they didn't notice it because it never happened to them in all the cases that they tried. They were lazy. That happens a lot too. But anyway, so this is what I was, I'm interested in looking at here is just this guy here for this, for this case 
and we can talk about how to handle invalid data at a later date. Uh, so that covers everything that this video needs to cover. So I hope you enjoyed this. Hope you learned a lot from it. If you have any questions or concerns or anything like that, or if I misspoke, which is always a possibility, please email me at swordb at cod.edu or get a hold of me here in the comments and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. So next videos will be next week's videos or next time's videos will be moving on away from if statements and into looping structures. We're talking for loops, uh, while loops, and do while loops. And uh, hope to see you there. Have a great day, everybody. Take care.